The Inside Edge has been a tribe for 35 years. And it started out in 1985 and attracted people like Jack Canfield, Barbara DeAngelis, Louise Hay, people like that before they'd written any books. And a lot of them credit the Inside Edge with being, you know, the, the catalyst that got them to move into such great success in the world. And so we're still going 35 years later. This is really an amazing team of people. Okay, so now it's time to introduce my hero. This is Robin Mullen, who is the president of the Inside Edge, and she's going to lead us in a, an opening meditation. Good morning and welcome everybody, especially our first time guests. It's really delightful to have you with us. We have a tradition at the Inside Edge and that is before we open ourselves to hear our presentation for the day to learn and grow and evolve together, we, we wanna get the very most out of that experience. So what we do is we spend a few minutes, usually three, four minutes to center ourselves and have a guided meditation or some form of of really bringing ourselves fully present to the morning. And so I'd like you to, to invite you to do that with us this morning. And today um, we're gonna start by just aligning our bodies for physical bodies first to make sure we're sitting in a comfortable position and as straight as we can to help the energy flow easily. Our feet are probably on the ground, our shoulders are relaxed and our hands just fall naturally where they will. And then let's take some nice deep cleansing breaths. I normally will close my eyes to help myself focus as I do that. So slow and calm, uh, deep breaths in. And then releasing any tensions, worries, anxieties, rushing thoughts. Deep breath in again releasing whatever isn't going to be helpful for you in this present moment. Another breath in. And bring your attention now to your heart center, to that uh, center of your body where we have the fourth chakra and some traditions, a place where we just have the innate capacities for love, for inner harmony, for compassion and empathy. Just built right into our bodies is this ability to be calm and know inner peace. And of course, all outer peace starts from within. So with the next few breaths over the next minute or so in silence, listening to some music, Take your breaths and just really hone in on that innate harmony and peace within yourself so that you're prepared to, be, to get the most out of hearing our speaker in a few minutes. Thank you very much for playing along with us on that. And let's now just open our hearts and our minds and just have a really joyful and enriching morning. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. You can put in your reactions if you enjoyed that. I did. You, you can tell that I'm a lot more calm than I was before that. That was great. And now it's my super great honor to introduce my favorite co-host, uh, Harry Mullen, who is very familiar with Sara, and he's going to really take over now. Thank you very much. I'm also your only co-host, but that, I appreciate the sentence. Uh, Sara Khan is a speaker, an advocate, a peacemonger, and she will be telling us what she means by peacemonger. It's a phrase that she coined. She's been recognized 
really across the globe. TEDx speaks, speeches at synagogues, churches, local television, radio. And even Forbes magazine has recognized her and Toastmasters itself, both as one of the top 30 public speakers in the world. This was in 2012. And just this month, as one of five women who are recognized as inspirational speakers in honor of the Women's uh, Week celebration just this month. I met Sarah through Toastmasters and was fascinated by the way she speaks. She will be talking to us about the inner journey, which is very much what Inside Edge is all about, because without the inner journey, there really isn't any external journey. It's just us projecting ourselves out on the world. And I really, really appreciate her own capacity for empathy and the story that she brings. Please help me welcome, for the first time at the Inside Edge, Sarah Khan. Thank you so much, Harry, for the wonderful introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good, good night. Whatever the time is there, everyone, it is such an incredible honor and a pleasure to be here amongst you all. So like Harry mentioned, although I don't a lot of different hats, you know, a speaker, a trainer, an advocate, you know, the one that's closest to my heart is a peacemonger. So basically, as a peacemonger, what I do is I fiercely promote peace by building bridges of understanding between communities through empathy. Now, we could certainly use more peacemongers today, isn't it? Right? You know, guys, it feels like we're living in an ideological combat zone, isn't it? Our differences are intensifying and the polarization is tearing the seams of society. And this isn't just an American illness. This is a global pandemic. Now, you know, one of my uh, favorite social scientists once said, people are hard to hate close up, so move in. So as a peacemonger, whenever I give talks on the importance of fostering peace, I always include stories from my childhood. Now, even though I've been in the United States for almost three decades, believe it or not, you can't tell from my accent, <laughs> but I still consider myself a Bombayite and a proud Indian as India is my birth country. Now, you know, guys, you should see the way people stare at me when I tell them that I was born in a Hindu country raised as a Muslim in a conservative Islamic household. And since the age of three, I studied under nuns in an all girls Catholic convent. Yep, yeah, to them, it seems like the perfect formula for spontaneous combustion. <laughs> but you know, in reality, it equipped me with the ability to not only empathize, but also to express tolerance and respect for those on the opposite ends of my ideological spectrum. Now, I remember when I was a little girl back home, every morning I would wake up at the crack of dawn and then I'd lay my little prayer rug down and then I'd say, Allahu Akbar, and then I'd start praying. And then at school, we would all march our way to the church where the nuns and the priest would start the morning prayers with, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now, you know, my favorite part was um, after mass, when they'd pass around that wafer dipped in holy water. Has anyone ever tried that? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. so you know right? You know that it has no taste, right? But you know, the mere joy that came from sharing it with all of my Catholic friends made its taste as sweet as paradise. Now, since my neighbors were all Hindus, my favorite trips with them would be to the temple. Now, I remember as a tiny girl, I would have to jump really high to ring those temple bells. Thankfully, as an adult, I don't have to jump anymore. Yeah, I'd use a step stool because I'm vertically challenged. Now, I know my Toastmaster friends are like, we know that. <laughs> She's the size of Thumbelina. <laughs> But you know, after that, we'd all join our hands and then we'd bow our head in prayer. 
and then wait for the temple priest to distribute those mouth-watering Indian sweets. Now, I remember this one time we had a potluck, okay? And uh, Annie, my Catholic friend, she brought pork chops. And I was like, swine? Referring to the chops, of course, not to Annie. Whereas Preeti, my Hindu friend, she looked at my beef kebabs and yelled, holy cow! You know, guys, even though we nourished ourselves with different foods and wisdom traditions, we not, uh, because we had moved in, we not only tolerated, but celebrated our differences. Now, my last memories of India were the Bombay riots that followed the Babri Mosque demolition. As a young girl, I was oblivious to how religions can be exploited, manipulated, and leveraged for political gain. You know, when you become or when we become too attached to an ideology, whether it be political or religious, we leave no room for nuance. You're either with us or you're against us. That's the mentality. What we don't realize is that both sides' perspective is their only reality. So their truth is as self-evident to them as ours is to us. Now, what I'll always remember about the Bombay riots is that our Hindu neighbors risked their lives to protect us against the Hindu mobs that went door to door looking to kill Muslims. Now, because our neighbors had moved in and gotten to know us, they were able to empathize with our perspective and, uh, and understand our vulnerable situation. And had we not moved in, we would have never trusted them with our lives, knowing that they belong to the same religion as the Moraders who wanted to kill us. Embracing our shared humanity by coming closer. That has been my only experience in India. And then in the early 90s, my family and I uh, moved to America in pursuit of the American dream. I don't mean owning a 7-Eleven, okay? But you know, 9-11 changed everything for me. On September 11th, 2001, when America came under attack, fear gripped our country and doubts became justified. Now people started questioning not only the nation's security and their personal safety, but also the loyalty of fellow Americans of Muslim faith. As the nation succumbed to Islamophobia, Muslims became victims of hate, of prejudice and violence. Have you ever been judged, anyone? Hmm? Or, yeah, have you ever been treated um, or criticized or treated differently based on how you look or based on how you sound or where you're from? Now imagine being bullied in public because of your physical appearance and their ignorance. Now I've had random people yell profanities at me at malls and at grocery stores. I've had parents fearfully pull their kids away from mine at parks. I've been told, get out of my country, you camel jockey. And that's horrible, you know? Not only because it's hateful, but also because I'm from India where we ride elephants, not camels. I'm joking, we, we don't ride elephants. But you know, after enduring countless Islamophobic attacks by white Americans, including almost being run over by a woman in her white SUV while I was holding my infant in my arm and I had my toddler by my side, I withdrew into a shell and I developed a phobia of all white Americans. Now this social phobia eventually turned into agoraphobia. I was too afraid to leave my house. Now I remember this one time, you know, my husband was out of town. It was a weekend. And I realized at night that I had run out of milk. Now I couldn't step out of my room, let alone my house from fear of the hatred that lurked outside. So I just sat there all night, 
holding one kid in each arm, tears streaming down my eyes, watching them as they cried themselves to sleep. Hungry. I was falling apart from the Islamophobic attacks that led to my severe social phobia of white Americans. But here's the thing. What I didn't realize is that just as they had generalized about all Muslims being terrorists, which led to Islamophobic attacks against us, I had started to generalize about all white Americans being Islamophobes. Now that perception did not change until after I entered intensive therapy. Now during our uh, group therapy sessions, I was surrounded by white Americans. Now I remember every morning, you know, all of the patients of various anxiety disorders, they would all sit in a circle in this large room, okay? To my right was Mr. OCD. To my left, Ms. PTSD. And as for me, Miss Congeniality. I'm joking. I actually held two titles, Miss Social Anxiety Disorder and Miss Agoraphobia. Now our very first exposure therapy exercise would be to introduce ourselves to the class. So you know guys, the whole drill that starts with, hello, my name is, right? Have you guys ever had anxiety over the fear of having anxiety? <laughs> Now we have a lot of Toastmasters members here. I'm sure they'd agree, right? You know, guys, my anxiety was so intense that when my turn came to introduce myself, not only couldn't I remember what to say, I couldn't even remember my name. Now the hot flush of embarrassment I felt every time that happened over the next few days could have easily been avoided with name tags. But you know, slowly as I started to feel safe and opened up, as we shared our deepest fears, our adversities and vulnerabilities, we realized just as musician Ronnie Dunn sings, we all say words we regret. We all cry tears, we all bleed red. That was completely off tune, but you get it, right? <laughs> So, you know, my therapist, Joanne, at that intensive anxiety program, she was blonde, blue eyed and very similar in stature to the lady in the parking lot who almost ran us over. And, you know, whenever I shared my Islamophobic experiences with her, she would get teary eyed and she'd always offer to hug me. So as I got closer to the people I feared and got to know them better, my walls fell down and we built bridges of understanding through empathy. Now, the day I joined Toastmasters organization, I was assigned a Jewish mentor named Holly. Now, I remember this one time, Holly said to me, Sarah, come over for bagels and locks. Now, having misheard and for in all along during my drive, I just kept wondering, why do Jews lock their bagels? Now, you know, guys, um, even though Holly and I had formed a beautiful friendship, uh, deep down, I'd always wonder, what does she really think of me? Not as a friend, not even as a mentee, but as a Muslim. And then one day, Holly said to me, you know, Sara, even though I'll never bear children, you, you have filled that void in my life. Now we did have our differences. She'd weep for her loved ones in Israel and I would for mine in Palestine. Yet our hearts were always intertwined like the messages of our holy scriptures. People are hard to hate close up. When we move in, we have the opportunity to hear stories that we would have otherwise never been able to hear. Stories about how innocent people get dragged into ideological wars and are left with nothing but broken windows, broken bones, and broken families. 
Now, when I joined stand-up comedy, I met Gordon, my very first atheist friend. Now, even though we seemed worlds apart, humor and homos transcended our differences and bonded us. By the way, guys, the best way to move in is to break bread with strangers. They're bound to become your friends after that. You know, as they say, the closest way to the heart is through the stomach. And my husband would agree to that. <laughs> so I remember this one time, Gordon posted a picture of us on Facebook with a caption, my favorite Muslim, to which I replied, dude, I am the only Muslim you know. Peace in pluralism and unity in diversity. That's the beauty of humanity. Now today in the, uh, the news media or the politicians who dominate the airwaves, they use dehumanization to divide people and promote hate. Dehumanization demonizes those perceived as the enemy by using words and images to portray them as morally degenerate. Now, as a Muslim of Kashmiri descent, I'm well aware of their struggle for human dignity and self-determination. And yet, having had distant relatives in the Indian military, I've listened to heartfelt stories about sacrifice they made for their country. And as an Indian married to a Pakistani, I've heard similar stories of sacrifice from my husband's relatives who served in the Pakistani military. So I've had the unique opportunity to hear stories uh, on, from both sides. You know, empathy can be a radical force for transformation. So we must extend the boundaries of our moral universe by embracing our enemies. I've listened to the hurt and have been moved to tears by cries on both sides. And most importantly, I've come to realize that we all share the same hopes. We all share the same dreams, the same love of country and the same willingness to sacrifice to protect our people. Now, did you guys know that uh, when Mahatma Gandhi uh, witnessed the conflict between Muslims and Hindus leading up to India's independence in 1947, did you know what he declared? I'm a Muslim and a Hindu and a Christian and a Jew. From the comfort of our living rooms, based on the information that we receive from the news media, it's very easy to decide what the fate of a people should be, what's best for them. But how can we render judgment without listening to their stories? Now, as a hijabi Muslim with such a diverse background, I may be easy to hate, especially in today's political climate. Unless, of course, people are willing to move in and get to know me. And that is why we should break bread with strangers, especially get to know those with different opinions and different uh, uh, views. Let go of the attitude that for me to be right, I must prove you to be wrong. Arguments may win debates, but never win hearts. So guys, moving in by embracing our differences while recognizing our shared humanity is the only way to foster peace in a turbulent world. But here's the catch. As the Lai Lama once said, world peace begins with inner peace. Thus, in order to promote peace around, we must first create peace within. So guys, is it possible to cultivate calm amid chaos? Hmm? Or even harder, is it possible to maintain peace within while being victimized by injustice? It is possible, but it's not easy. It requires the art of attitude. Let me share with you a story. How many here love coffee? 
Yeah, awesome. Oh, there's so many. Now imagine guys, imagine you just entered your favorite coffee shop, okay? You can smell the aroma of coffee beans in the air. You start walking up to the register, all smiles, and then suddenly you see a face grouchier than the Grinch. You know, guys, the barista who makes cappuccino at my neighborhood cafe, he always smiles and greets everyone in the queue until it's my turn. And then suddenly his face turns to stone. No smiles, just eyes glaring like he's grinding my soul along with the coffee beans. Actually, you know who does he remind me of? The soup Nazi from Seinfeld. You guys remember? No soup for you. Yeah, that guy. You know, I'm sure it's the hijab I always used to think of. As I've experienced uh, that during post 9-11 um, Islamophobia. Now earlier in such situations, I'd feel hurt. I'd feel angry, I'd feel offended. My knee jerk reaction would have been to confront him. But all of that changed a few years ago. So what happened a few years ago? Well, I was in Chicago, my hometown, visiting my family as I do every summer. And it was one of those sweaty, sultry summer days in the Windy City. And I promised my boys and my nephew that I'd take them to the park where they could run around as much as they wanted. But first I needed to stop at a store. Now, I remember uh, walking into the store looking like a mama goose with all five boys trailing behind me like a row of ducklings. Now, Ibrahim, my youngest nephew, he was wearing his superhero cape, you know, just in case he wanted to save all the women from overspending, you know, that happens. Now, as I pushed my cart along, suddenly I got this eerie feeling that I was being watched. Is there anyone who's ever felt like that? Hmm? Okay. Now, for all those who didn't raise their hands, clearly you guys are the ones stalking. Hmm? You know, I noticed an employee at a distance and she was staring straight at us. Now, Idris, my youngest son, he accidentally stepped on a plush toy that was lying on the floor. Within seconds, the employee rushed towards us yelling, don't step on that. I said, I'm so sorry, it was an accident. She, no, it wasn't, she insisted. And then she stormed away, hands clenched, clenched by her side. Now seeing my face turn red from anxiety, my older son, Jibril, got scared. I confronted him and I said, that's okay, I'm all right. But I wasn't okay. Feelings of guilt and shame swept over me. I felt horrible for not standing up for my son when she yelled at him. But you know, I didn't want my kids to see my inner conflict, so I just continued shopping. Right then, my nephew, Ibrahim, he started to untie his superhero cape, and then he dropped it on the floor complaining, my neck hurts. Now I look up and I see the same employee barreling towards us. She grabbed the cape furiously. I said, it doesn't belong to the store, it belongs to the kid. Frustrated, she flung the cape back down and stomped away grumbling under her breath. As I watched my kids stare at me with wide eyes, I thought to myself, that's it, I am not going to take this anymore. So I followed her and confronted her about her attitude. I said, what is your problem? She turned around and screeched, your kids are animals. I said, how dare you talk about my kids like that? She hollered even louder and the conflict escalated. Now guys, my heart started pounding so hard from both anger and anxiety that I felt like it would break through my chest. I kept thinking, don't be weak. Don't let her int intimidate you. The kids are watching. Now fuming, she walked away and she disappeared into the employee's only room. I called over another clerk and I demanded that she summon the manager insisting that I was not going to leave the store until that employee admitted her appalling behavior and apologized. Now, when the store manager didn't arrive, I asked for the complaint center number. And then I took my phone 
and then I put it on speaker so that the kids could hear the entire conversation. And then I explained the whole incident to the complaint manager. Now the complaint manager uh, apologized profusely. He assured me that disciplinary action would be taken and then said that he would call me right back after he had spoken to that employee. So I thanked him for being proactive. And then I turned to the kids and I told them, see how I handled it? Don't ever be weak. Don't ever be scared. And don't ever let anyone walk all over you. Now I felt like I was being a good role model for the kids. And then a week passed and I had still not received a call from the complaint department. It made me wonder, did the manager do what he had promised? Now the following week, I was back in LA with my kids and resumed my routine. And yet, you know, every now and then when the store incident popped in my head, I would wonder, could I have done anything differently? And then one day during my weekly session with my teacher, uh, which by the way, um, for some of you already know, I'm an ardent student of spiritual philosophy, because you know, as a Muslim, our faith encourages us to study all faiths. So I'm currently studying Advaita Vedanta, and I would encourage you all to consider studying uh, Islam, because guys, that is the only way for us to understand and to appreciate each other's wisdom and traditions. And that is the only way for us to recognize our similarities and to embrace our differences. Otherwise, you know, we will always be easily influenced by politicians spewing hate and divisiveness with their us versus them propaganda. Now, surely in the deepest desires of heart and mind, they're all the same, isn't it? So going back to my story, uh, so during my weekly session, when I was um, talking to my teacher, I mentioned to her the store incident. And I was naturally expecting sympathy for the way I was treated and validation for how I handled the situation. Now she listened patiently without uttering a word. And then when I finished, she, she said something completely unexpected, something that was taught to her by her teachers. She said, when someone throws negativity at you, you have three choices. Absorb, reflect, transform. That's the A-R-T, art of attitude. The ability to choose one's demeanor in any situation. You know, it took me a few days to fully grasp the wisdom of her words. Now, when I initially remained quiet at the store, I was internalizing my pain by blaming myself for being weak and for not fighting back. Now, when we absorb negativity, it hurts us because the words or behavior trigger an already deeply seated insecurity in us. For example, in my case, I have long believed that I'm weak. Now for someone else, it could be I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. Now, when I finally mustered the courage to fight back, although I believed that my reaction was justified at the time, I was reflecting the same negative behavior of that person that got me upset in the first place. You know, if someone wrongs us through their words or actions, it seems normal and natural to get angry, to get upset, to get frustrated, isn't it? Because that is our knee-jerk emotional reaction. In fact, it may even reassure us that we are being courageous enough to stand up to such people. But does that momentary reassurance help us or does it hurt us in the long run? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Let me give you an example. If I were to throw a burning hot coal at someone, whose hand would get burned first? Mine, isn't it? 
similarly in order to fight back those negative unpleasant reactions like anger they have to be aroused in us first which means we experience them first they affect us before they reach their target so is it worth it even if the other person deserves it even if the other person started it you know philosopher um epictetus he once said any person capable of angering you becomes your master he can anger you only when you permit yourself to be disturbed by him now i thought i was being a good role model for the boys by being strong and fighting back but what i showed them that i was so weak that i had no control over my reaction because they fluctuate based on other people's behavior towards me now if people are kind to us we feel good right if they are mean to us we get angry we get hurt we feel humiliated and so on when our temperament is nurtured or inflamed by an environment we are held hostage we become prisoners of others emotional caprices now today we are strongly inclined to fight anger with anger hate with hate vitriol with vitriol continually reflecting each other's behavior perceiving that to be strength in fact responding in kind eliminates any chance of building peace plus when we outsource all of our hurt to others by saying that we reacted negatively because of what they said or what they did guess what we empower them to dictate our emotions now there's nothing inherently wrong with standing up for what is right it is the way that we do it that distinguishes strength from weakness for example bad actions should have consequences yet fighting back with fear with intimidation with punishment it does not create any meaningful or lasting change in the other person's behavior it only further perpetuates the situation right let alone the negative feelings they already harbor towards us now guys if i had changed my attitude if i had remained calm and composed irrespective of the clerk's negative behavior and if i had responded positively with kindness patience and respect then maybe maybe she would have realized that her actions were out of line maybe she would have stopped her aggression or at least taken it down a notch after all it takes two for a conflict to thrive you know just as water can penetrate the hardest of rock despite the softest property persistent gentleness is needed to penetrate the hardest of hearts and transform them but maintaining peace within by staying calm and being polite in the face of anger and vitriol is not easy it requires strength it requires us to declare our emotional independence from the words and actions of others now like the barista at my favorite neighborhood cafe who always glares and grumbles while taking my order now earlier i would have absorbed or i would have reflected his negativity but this is what i started doing whenever i felt an impulse to react i'd leave and then one day i mustered up the courage to practice a little bit of emotional independence so what i did is i not only smiled when i reached the counter but i also swallowed my pride and said hello as he ignored my greeting and then i tossed in a have a nice day before leaving you know guys the inherent quality of a rose is that it radiates beauty and fragrance isn't it you know whether it is given uh, to celebrate uh, or to commemorate the death of a loved one 
right? Now, just like the rose, we all have such beautiful innate qualities like love, like peace, like joy, because that is our true nature. But one bad behavior from someone and we let go of our beauty and we absorb or reflect the ugliness. Now, the next time I visited the coffee shop, I was feeling frisky. So I threw in a, how's your day going? And guess what? The soup Nazi returned my smile and said, not bad, how about you? And we even exchanged some pleasantries. And you know, before I could deliver my parting line, he beat me to the punch by saying, have a nice day. So you see guys, when the qualities we radiate are not dependent on the other person's behavior, our persistent softness can penetrate the hardest of hearts and transform them. Now the barrister and I are never going to be bosom buddies. But that summer, my teacher made me realize in a world where we crave freedom, liberation, and independence, we are too often emotionally dependent. Because if anyone can make us happy, can make us upset, can make us angry, it means that we are trapped in a state of emotional slavery. Our declaration of emotional independence is at the heart of maintaining peace within. And when we become emotionally independent, we can tolerate any temperament because our inner tranquility is inviolate. And once we can tolerate any temperament, our attitude can inspire transformation in others. Now, you know, when I think of people who exemplified emotional independence, who transformed themselves from within, two names come to mind, Nelson Mandela and Viktor Frankl. Now, did you guys know that during Nelson Mandela's imprisonment on Robben Island, the prison guards would take him outside on Thursdays and make him uh, dig a trench six feet deep. And when he was done, the guards would order Mandela to lie down on, in the ditch and then they would urinate on him. Now, years later, when Mandela was about to be inaugurated as the first leader of South Africa, he was asked who would he like to invite to his first formal dinner as president? And guess what he said? The prison guards from Robin Island. After going through such horrors in prison, any ordinary person would have been consumed by thoughts of revenge, isn't it? And yet Mandela had no resentment or anger because he did not absorb or reflect the negativity. And due to his attitude and his ability to maintain peace within, Mandela was able to promote peace around and transform the lives of others. Now, his example also demonstrates that the source of our suffering is not the other person's bad temperament, but our inability to tolerate it. Guys, we are victims of our own personalities. Thus, in order to change our experience, we must work on the resistance our personality generates. And the reason why our personality generates resistance is revealed in a much deeper truth, which may be very hard to digest. Are you guys ready? The soil can only bring out what's already in the seed. I repeat, the soil can only bring out what's already in the seed. Likewise, if hostility comes out of us, it is part and parcel of our personality. All it takes to trigger that tendency is for someone to show hostility towards us, to get angry at us or to insult us. 
Remember, despite his horrific treatment in prison, Mandela harbored no anger or no resentment because the soil cannot draw what's not in the sea. We are prisoners of our own personalities. We sink and swim with our nature. And so in order to change our experience, we must work on our personality. Now, Viktor Frankl, he was stripped of all of the earthly possessions and tortured in a Nazi camp during World War II. And yet, due to his optimism, he survived and he helped others survive. And he believed that everything can be taken away from a person except the last human freedom, the ability to choose one's attitude under any circumstance. So you see guys, while we may not be able to control the outer world, situations, people, their actions, we have full control of our inner world. And when we can maintain our inner peace, despite outside turmoil, by becoming emotionally independent, then it becomes easier to accept people and situations just the way they are. Now, don't get me wrong, acceptance does not mean that we agree with their actions. It only means that our inner peace is not dependent or disrupted by their wrongdoing. Now, this revolution in perception leads to profound liberation because it transfers power from the external world back to ourselves. You know, the parable of Buddha and the second arrow arrives at the same trip. And did you know that Buddha once asked a student, if a person is struck by an arrow, is it painful? The student replied, yes, it is. And then Buddha asked, if a person is struck by a second arrow, is it even more painful? The student said, yes, of course. And then Buddha explained, in life, you cannot always control the first arrow, but the second arrow is your reaction to the first. And with the second arrow comes the possibility of choice. So you see guys, we are not helpless, helpless victims of the world, rather victims of the attitudes we bring to it. Remember, world peace begins with inner peace. So, in a world full of angry fist and raised voices, reflecting anger, hate, and vitriol, perceiving that to be strength, in a world full of broken hearts due to ideological welfare, warfare, spewing hate and divisiveness, I implore you to become torchbearers of peace. Peace within and without. And while moving in is the best way to spread peace around, the art of attitude is the only way to maintain peace within. Now, activist and author Shane Claiborne says, Peacemaking is the act of interrupting injustice without mirroring it. The act of disarming evil without destroying the evildoer. The act of finding a third way that is neither fight nor flight. It is a revolution of love that sets both the oppressed and the oppressor free. So to conclude, the world needs more peacemongers. And peace is the only battle worth waging. Thank you so much, everyone. And back to you, Harry. Oh, marvelous. So terrific. I love that transformation. You know? And I was thinking, though, that story of the second arrow. You know, it's really hard sometimes when you're getting triggered 
to find that second arrow. Do you have a suggestion of maybe something you can do? Yes, you know, um, Harry, the thing is that um, when somebody says something hurtful, something mean to us, the reaction, the internal emotional reaction, it is, you know, if, if you feel, uh, you know, you feel that hurt or if you feel sad or, you know, if it, it makes you sensitive, at that point, it's okay. It's an emotional reaction, right? But at that physical level, the action, the uh, response is completely in your hand, which means that you can either react based on that emotional feeling or you can be more mindful in your response. Now, once we have that perspective that if I react, it is really not going to, um, it is really not going to serve the purpose that I wanted to. It is not going to change the other person's perspective. It is not going to make him understand what I'm trying to say. Then I'll automatically realize that that is not the right way of doing it. I need to be more mindful in the way I respond to the person because I want the other party to really understand uh, either what they're doing is wrong or to just hear my perspective out, right? So uh, we, there's, um, you know, actually it reminded me of something Viktor Frankl says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our freedom. So remember between stimulus and response, there is that space. So that in instant emotional um, reaction of hurt or anger, Acknowledge it, accept it, embrace it, and then realize that you don't have to react based on that. You can still be very collective and uh, mindful in your response. Hope that helps, uh, Harry. Yeah, it really does. I was thinking, it, you had mentioned when we talked before, there was an exercise uh, that mm. you had done along those lines. Maybe you could uh -huh. share that. Oh, yes, absolutely, Harry. Oh, I have this wonderful exercise. You know, guys, whenever I do interviews or speak at interfaith events that are followed by Q&A, there's always difference of opinion. And what I do is I take an approach called the yes and approach, which I actually learned in improv comedy. So I basically once I got a scholarship to the best improv comedy school. So in this yes to an approach, how it works is when the other person states an opinion that you might not agree with, and that happens a lot of times, right? You still acknowledge it, and then you express yours. So what you're doing is when you allow the other person to speak first, you give them the right of listening to them rather than cutting them off. They become more receptive to your perspective. So the exercise, Harry, that I usually do, and it's a very simple exercise, uh, it is uh, uh, for the yes and approach is Coke versus Pepsi, okay? So this is going to be the difference of opinion because we're not going into political or other ideological things. We'll keep it very simple for our guest. So one person likes Coke and the other person likes Pepsi, okay? I'm going to use a yes and approach and I'm going to show you how what it looks like. Now, one, the person who likes Coke says, I think Coke is the best drink in the world. The other person says, yes, and I feel the same way about Pepsi. Yes, I can understand that because Pepsi has always been there, up there as Coke's biggest competitor. Yes, and recently it's also been rated number one amongst consumers. Yes, you're right, that's incredible, even though overall Coke is still doing better. So you see, <laughs> Yeah. So the thing is, guys, we don't have to agree or we don't have to accept each other's truth as our truth, but we have to agree that we are all entitled to having our truth be treated with respect. And also we have to let go of the attitude that for me to be right, I have to prove you to be wrong. Now, Harry, uh, what we usually do is another improv exercise, <laughs> and it's called the no but exercise. <laughs> I'm just sure many people are familiar with that. And basically, in the no but exercise, this is how it works, okay? So I'm going to demonstrate the no but. The lines are exactly the same, 
Okay. Now, li li uh, look at my body language and uh, listen to my tone, my vocal variety when I'm doing no but. Okay. I think Coke is the best drink in the world. No, Pepsi is the best. But if uh, but Coke has been rated one by Consumer Report. But if you look at the recent polls, more people drink Coke than Pepsi. No, you're wrong. No, but you're an idiot. <laughs> So you know what's happening, right? We are all, we are both meeting each other with facts, right? And it immediately plates into a conflict. Basically, this is what the yes and and the no but approach looks like. And you can use it in any context, whether it be in your personal, professional, or social life. Oh, that's wonderful. I like that. Uh, let me uh, turn this over back to, uh, to Diana. Uh, I think we have some time for Q&A. But Diana, please take it away. We do. We have time for uh, Q and A. Who has a question that they would like to ask Sara? From, from I saw really, Sahar's I, hand was up, and Sahar and I are actually in Toastmasters together. Okay, good. Each other before this, so Sahar. Go ahead, Sahar. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was amazing, uh, Sara. Thank you so much for the wonderful, amazing speech I, you were talking I'm saying how did she do that for all this time and I'm you know I'm very new at Toastmasters so it will take me like five minutes I look at it as five hours but for <laughs> you it was flowing amazing and I am so proud of you I'm so touched by your speech I actually can relate to it I am from Baghdad Iraq I fled the country because of war and uh, a lot of uh, sectarian violence. Mm -hmm. I belong to a different sect uh, from the Shia, so we were prosecuted. And uh, I came here, and when I landed here, uh, I said, you know, it's over. I can start again. This is my new home. And it was a few years later, we were in war with the country that I fled. Mm -hmm. And September 11 hit. So I felt, you know, I I am the situation that I from. I wasn't uh, hit with a lot of discrimination. Uh, I found people to be very welcoming because I lived in England before and I did, you know, uh, feel a lot of prejudice there to the point where I quit school. Mm -hmm. at middle school i had to i just couldn't take it anymore mm -hmm. i was called different things the first words that i learned in the english language were all profound words which is all you know it was very uh, sad but uh, now i look back at my childhood and whatever is uh, you know whatever i went through it made me a stronger person and Absolutely. i i cherish everything that i see in this country and i am so blessed uh, and I feel, you know, there is no space for me to complain about anything mm -hmm. because I saw what's happening in different countries. And no matter what happens, you know, I see the positivity. I mm -hmm. see how people are accepting. And I truly feel blessed to be here. Mm -hmm. Your speech touched my heart. It brought back a lot of memories to me as a child. Mm -hmm. And I really want to thank you, Sarah. And I want to thank uh, Harry who invited me to this. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank God you so bless you. Oh, thank thank you, so you so much, Sahar, sir, for sharing that and for sharing your experience. And uh, Sahar, you probably know Khalil Gibran, right? Famous Sufi poet. Uh, you, your story reminded me of something because you said that you're, you're grateful that whatever you went through, that you did, uh, you know, Khalil Gibran says that your pain is the breaking of your shell that encloses your understanding. So every right painful incident carries a lesson and we continue to suffer until it has taught us exactly what we need to know that we need to learn and always in my personal humble experience always from our pain we come um, from that state of being a victim first to becoming a warrior to becoming a victim so just like you, I too, uh, during my painful incidents, I used to, there were times when I was suicidal as well because I couldn't handle it, especially post 9-11 Islamophobic attacks because it was for um, a decade. 
But uh, now being at this place, being able to uh, become a peacemonger and an advocate for empathy, I am so grateful to everything that I went through because had it not been for those painful experiences, I would not even be here today, <laughs> you know, sharing my messages with such a wonderful group as the uh, Inside Edge Foundation. So I can absolutely empathize with uh, everything that you shared today. And thank you so much for being so courageous and vulnerable to be able to open up and share with all of us. Thank Good. you. And we have, we have another question from yes. Cynthia. I think she's the next one with her hand up. Do you want to, there she is. Hi. <laughs> oh, um, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, uh, Sarah, that was amazing. I love your approach to peacemongering, and I just want to be part of the movement. Um, I wonder, like the, the woman that just shared, her name was uh, Sahar, mm -hmm. her sharing was so beautiful and heartfelt. I wonder if we could do, um, be, as an American, um, there are, there's not enough connection with Muslims. And mm -hmm. I, I'm part of Leaders Worldwide and we have a very diverse group and we have a couple of people, people from Bahrain that are Muslim. Mm -hmm. And I never knew that the country of Bahrain existed. So <laughs> this is really good that I'm getting to know them. And what I'm finding is the Muslim men in our, in our, um, in our club are so different than the picture that I've been painted of Muslim men. Mm -hmm. And so if Muslim men and women could share their heart in like a short videos and like a clip going out so that people can get to know Muslims and, and get to know their hearts. Absolutely, Cynthia. That's that's a great point you made. Um, you know, there's a lot of us doing that kind of work out there, but maybe um, it hasn't been that mainstream and exposed yet. And you're absolutely right. We not just us, uh, you know, not just you guys getting to know us, we want to get to know you as well. So mm -hmm. definitely, um, that is something that is much needed. And there was something else I wanted to say, I completely forgot, it slipped my mind, but I'll say as soon as I remember, I'll let you, <laughs> I'll let you know, but thank you so much. Uh, and, so uh, do we have, I just remember, sorry, one second, Diana. I just remembered something that you said okay. about uh, the misconceptions about, uh, you know, Muslims because of the fact that, you know, we haven't met uh, enough yet. You know, there's a newscaster by the name Nick Nicholas Kristoff, and he says that the media only reports the planes that crash, not the planes that take off safely. Right. So all we knew about planes was from the media, assume every plane crashes. So similarly, uh, you know, regretfully, sometimes all the only information that we get about Muslims or maybe some other minority is through the media. So mm -hmm. we Muslims need to make an effort to come out uh, and, you know, get to uh, get, expose ourselves to non uh, people of other faith. Uh, the other faith needs to make an effort to get to know those on the opposite ends mm -hmm. of the world spectrum and get to get to know more Muslims. Mosques and community centers are a great uh, place uh, where you'll find a lot of Muslims too. But thank mm -hmm. you so much for everything that you, you are doing. Much, much. Yeah. For making that we effort. could make it go viral. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'd be willing to, to, to work with you. I have 30,000 followers worldwide in 140 yeah. plus countries. So let's oh. make it a video and make Google. Fire. Absolutely. Girl, you are already a peacemonger. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's great to have you here, Cynthia. Thank you so much. I wish we had time for a lot more questions. We have a commitment to finish our meeting at 1030. So uh, I'm going to move right along. And I'm just going to ask Sarah about your new passions or projects. Uh, you something about loud and proud and awake. And uh, go ahead and tell oh, us absolutely, what else absolutely. is going on. Okay, awesome. So I have a support group. It's called Awake Align Act. And basically, we are an online support group with weekly Zoom sessions dedicated to individual and collective transformation through learning. So the founders are, uh, sorry, one second. Okay, the founders are myself and uh, Tay Bond. She is a certified yoga instructor. And then we have James Jeffley, and he's a pastor, a spiritual counselor. And basically, what we do well, we call ourselves warriors with scars on a mission to create an empathy revolution 
by broadening our views about the mind, body, and soul and applying that knowledge to our lives. So that is Awake, Align, Act. And the next one is really, really exciting because I'm really excited about it. And it's called Loud and Proud. And this is my upcoming project. So basically this year, I'll be starting an after-school public speaking club in an Islamic school in San Diego. And I'm hoping to eventually have one in every Islamic school and in other schools. So it doesn't have to be Islamic schools. And what we'll do in this one is the unique thing, thing about this is that the kids will not only learn public speaking skills, but also interpersonal communication skills and learn how to de-escalate conflicts, how to challenge racism both within and without. Uh, and then, of course, improv and stand-up comedy skills, which I learned, and mindfulness therapeutic skills to help you cope with stage fright and anxiety. So all of that that I learned. And basically, all of this should enable them to become not only effective communicators, but uh, also torch bearers for peace, both within and without. So oh, wonderful. Thank you, Sarah, so much. What a fabulous speaker you are. And people can go to your website and they can find out about all sorts of things there, too. So perhaps Rebecca would put your website right there in the uh, in the chat so that everybody can see that and your Facebook page, of course. And links are going to be sent in the follow up email. You're going to have a recording of this session and you're going to have links to Sarah's work. So please look for that in your email. I just want to tell you about some upcoming events that we have that we're really excited about. Uh, in April on the 17th is Earth Day. And so it our April has the theme of Restore Our Earth. And with trending interest in forest bathing and the effects of nature on our bodies, we were searching for just the right author and speaker to lead us deeply into lessons from trees. Mm. Uh, and we're having a very famous speaker, Jean Shinoda Bolin is the author of 13 books and her book, Like a Tree, was recently completely revised. Mm. And it's very timely right now with all the attention going on about um, global warming and all of that. And she's going to be talking about how Buddha was enlightened under a Bodhi tree and the trees have been very, powerful symbols in different religions, especially the Druids. And there are sacred trees throughout the world. Family tree has a symbolic connection to the theme of immortality and all of that. So it's going to be all about trees and it's going to be on April 22nd. Uh, then we have uh, my story streaming workshop, which is part of the Writer's Edge, is going to be coming up this Saturday. It's four hours and it's a very, very powerful technique, which I will teach everyone on how to write without writer's block, how to get the real details, the, the sensory uh, feelings that go into a story and make it really compelling. So there's room to sign up for that. You'll find that on our website. Uh, and also let's see, we have, um, Robin has a few announcements. Oh, we have a workshop on the 13th of March, uh, which is Act 3, which is for people who are excited about in their elder years, creating a whole new persona, a whole new life, reinventing themselves. It's a fantastic theme. Um, okay, so now we, Robin, you're going to tell us about some announcements and the website and all of that. Thank you, Diana. Yes, we're excited. We have a we can do something every week with Inside Edge if you're so inclined. We have uh, <clears throat> speakers every second Wednesday of the month on our theme, kicking off our theme. And then we continue that the fourth Wednesday of every month. We have a community forum where we go deeper with that theme. So, for example, <clears throat> we got some good ideas today about some techniques to use to be, be better peacemongers. So our assignment, if you're a member especially, is that We'll be practicing in the next two weeks, the yes and, and also um, maybe reaching out to people that we don't know or know that well, some people we'd like, you know, maybe we'll go to a mosque, maybe we'll, we'll do something out of the box to, to take a step to learn more about people and, and diverse ideas from ours. So those, then we'll come back on the fourth Wednesday this month, which is the 24th, and we'll have our community forum. We'll have rounds of breakout rooms where we'll share our thoughts, we'll um, go a little deeper in some techniques, and we'll also share our wins and accomplishments and acknowledge 
um, birthdays and that kind of fun stuff. We have toasts. It's a really fun thing. So everyone here it, is more than welcome to come. All of our guests, you may attend that for free and continue the conversation with us on the 24th of March. And in your follow-up email, there will be a promo code you can enter with the link and you can uh, register for free to come and join us for that as well. So we'd love to see all of you come back and, and just continue going deeper with peace mongering. Um, and we do have a wonderful, fairly new website. It's at insideedge.org. And that's, you can go there and you can read more about what we do and who we are. We've been doing this 35 years and we have um, all of our upcoming events there that you can click on and, and find as well as um, some featured videos and all kinds of information. So we hope that you, um, you know, you, you explore us a little more if you're a first time guest and come back and visit us again. Uh, we just love having our global audience growing and uh, it's so fun to, to see you all here. So that's really my main announcement. And uh, again, just thank you so much for all of you for trusting us with your time this morning and in, in coming to, uh, to share the morning with us. Thank you. I hope so. I just really want to thank Sarah with all of my heart and with all of our hearts for her divine presentation. It was just enlightening and perfect and timely. And we all learned so much from you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and I'm turning it back to Harry. Yes, and thank you all for joining us here today. It really means just the world to us. And Diana, thank you. You are just the host that I inspired. It was wonderful <laughs> having you here. I hope you, you will join us uh, on our other events and we will see you as we all longer 